So I was ramping up. I was thinking about Easter because, I don't know, it, Passover snuck up on us and Easter snuck up on us. Uh, it's, it's like I was, you know, walking at night in, like, downtown Dallas, and then I looked over my shoulder, and then uh, Passover was like, boo! And I was like, oh, excuse me. And then Easter was right behind Passover, like, boo, boo, boo! And I was like, whoa. So we only have a few more weeks to prepare for Easter, so before we talk about Jesus being raised from the dead, I wanted to talk about the fact that Jesus has power to raise the dead. That this is not a parable, this is revival. This is when things that were alive have died, and Jesus brings back to life, amen? amen. So in John chapter 11, um, we'll just read the story, and then I'll talk a little bit. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters Mary and Martha. Now this is the Mary who later poured expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and then wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick, so the two sisters sent a message telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he said, Lazarus's sickness will not end in death. No, this has happened for the glory of God, so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. So although Jesus did love Martha and Mary and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days, finally saying to the disciples, all right, fellas, let's go back to Judea. And let's just leave it there for a few moments. Uh, we find from this story and from the, the first paragraph, and we'll find it again in John chapter 12, that this family was unique. Um, Bethany was, was, is a little town just north of Jerusalem. And if you've ever been to Jerusalem, and I would normally then pitch an, an Israel trip, but I can't do that because it's like we keep canceling and postponing the Israel tour. Uh, we're talking now about maybe rescheduling for November Maybe, so uh, maybe come with us to Israel in November, and I'll show you Bethany. Uh, when you go to um, Jerusalem from anywhere north of Israel, you come into a valley before going up, and then that's why the Psalms talk about going up to Jerusalem and worship. We go up to the house of the Lord, because you start out way down low in the plains of Israel, and then you go up like 3,000 feet to get up to Jerusalem. It's on top of Mount Zion in that range. So um, uh, Bethany is a little town at the foothill. So if you were uh, walking and camels and donkeys uh, from the north to get to Jerusalem, Bethany would be sort of a rest area. You'd stop for the night, uh, you'd get a hotel, you'd make a campfire, you'd eat something, you'd rest, and then you would make the hike up, which is you know, a fairly strenuous hike up to Jerusalem the following day. So clearly the disciples and Jesus, when they would come and go to Jerusalem, would stop at the house of Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And this was their, their, their regular um, stop on the way up or maybe even back down from Jerusalem. So there was a close relationship. There was a friendship. There was an intimacy. So uh, Lazarus, you know, without penicillin or ibuprofen or Band-Aids, you know, I mean, back then people just died for no reason. Like they just get up and it's a Tuesday and it's like, hey, look at the beautiful dead. You know, like so stuff happened back then. Um, so uh, Lazarus is quite sick and uh, clearly near death. So uh, sisters Mary and Martha send a servant. Oh, by the way, this family must have had some influence, some money. Normally when people would die in those days, uh, you had to bury the body within 24 hours. Um, it was Israel. It's the hot desert. Uh, there was no refrigeration. Uh, there was no uh, backhoe to like dig a very deep hole in a hurry. So um, they would bury people within 24 hours and uh, a fairly shallow grave. So if you were poor, you would just literally go out into a field and dig the best hole you could dig in an hour or two and, you know, put your dead friend, loved one in the hole and, you know, kick some dirt over them and, and then mourn for seven days. Because it would take time for word to spread that somebody had died. So your loved ones, your friends, your extended family would come. So the morning, the, the funeral would happen immediately, but it would take a day or two for people to show up and then there would be a week of mourning. So um, this servant, so, uh, so, so the fact that we find out later that Lazarus is buried in a tomb means that this family had some money. If this family was able to host, you know, uh, Jesus and the disciples and all the, you know, the, the entourage that would come along with Jesus in those days, um, they had to have had some wealth, a fairly large home, property, servants able to feed that many people. So they send a servant to go find Jesus, and Jesus was at least a day's journey away to say, hey, the, the one that you love, your beloved, Lazarus, your buddy, 
He's sick and near death. So the servant is like, I'm sure, imagine if you're the servant, right? And Mary and Martha's like, hey, the boss is dying. Go get Jesus because he will heal him. So the servant has faith in Jesus. The servant has heard Jesus speak. The servant might have heard, uh, seen Jesus do miracles. It's not recorded, but it's, it's probable that the servant is a Jesus lover. And is, I mean, running, 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 running. Hey, hey, where's Jesus and the boys? Oh, they're in the next town. He's running, running. Where's Jesus and the boys? Oh, they just went down to so-and-so. He's running, running, running. Where's Jesus and the boys? He's on the other side of town. Running, running, running. Where's Jesus and the boys? Oh, they're in that field over there, camped out. There's a service tonight. So he runs and runs and runs. He says, teacher, the one that you love, your buddy Lazarus, is sick and near death. And he's expecting Jesus to go, fellas, mount the horses, the fastest donkey, get me back to Bethany as soon as possible. And he's like, come on, let's, we got we to gotta go. Hey, JC, let's, let's go. Teacher, we, he might already be dead by now. Like, and Jesus is like, all right, hey, thanks for the message. Go get something to eat. Church starts at seven. And the kid's standing there like, I'm going to get fired. My boss is going to die. And this guy that I had faith in and that my boss has faith in and my, my, my bosses, Mary and Martha, have faith in doesn't care that my boss is going to die. So imagine the crisis of faith in the eyes of the servant. And he goes over and he gets a, a bowl of stew and he sits down and he's just like, I wanted God to do a man thing. I wanted God to do my thing. I wanted God to meet me when I got laid off. I wanted God to meet me when I had a miscarriage. I wanted God to do my thing when I got the pink slip. I wanted God to do my thing when I got the cancer diagnosis. I wanted God to do my thing when I was heartbroken and I was in pain and I was hurting. And God says, I'll be with you in a minute. See, sometimes we want God to do a man thing, but God always wants to do a God thing. And it can hurt, it can sting sometimes. Because church people, we just quote Romans 8, 28. Well, bless hallelujah, all things work together for good. How does it work together for good when there's not enough money to pay the rent? How does all things work together for good when I have to move in with my parents, with my kids, because I got laid off a year ago and I haven't found work? How is this working out for good? Jesus, I need you to come do a God thing now. He's like, I'm going to do a God thing, but I'm going to do it in such a way that God receives the glory, not that man receives the glory. So eat a bowl of stew and we'll go back in a few days. Let's get back to the story. Jesus said, <clears throat> we're going to go to Judea. The disciples said, uh, Rabbi, only just a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. You sure you want to go back there again? Jesus replied, there's 12 hours of daylight every day, and during the day, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of the world, but at night, there is danger of stumbling because they have no light. And they're like, what the heck does that have to do with going back to Judea? He said, our dear, Lazar our dear friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, so now I'm going to go wake him up. And then they're like, okay, the servant said he was sick. The boss said he's asleep. Well, Lord, if he's sleeping, he's just going to get better. Because they thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant the other form of sleeping that Lazarus had died. So then Jesus had to make it plain for them. No, guys, he's not sleeping. He's dead. And for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there, because now you will really believe. Come, let's go. Thomas, one of the disciples nicknamed the twin, said to the fellow disciples, let's go too and die with Jesus. I love sarcasm in the Bible. Sometimes Jesus is sarcastic, which I can totally understand that, that spirit of the Lord. But because we know that Thomas is a doubter, and we know that the people in Judea want to kill Jesus and the disciples, Thomas is like, oh, two days ago they were trying to kill you, and if, I want to remind you, uh, Lord, if they miss you with a stone, they're going to hit me. So yeah, let's all pack up the donkeys and head back to Judea where they could stone us. 
See, sometimes to do a God thing and not a man thing, it's going to take a level of faith that might cost you your life. The Apostle Paul said, I preach the gospel by life or by death. This isn't part of my notes because I have no notes. I'm just talking. Would you be willing to die for the gospel? And in church, you're like, oh, yes, Lord, I would be willing to die. Would you be willing to be shot and killed or stoned or beaten for Jesus' sake? Because right now, we have brothers and sisters of faith throughout the Muslim world in North Africa and the Middle East. We have brothers and sisters of faith in very extreme parts of Hindu India, where they're literally being stoned, shot, beheaded, because they proclaim faith in Jesus. And what I've seen happen in our country in the last 50 days is kind of alarming at how the government is treating people with Judeo-Christian values. We're being treated like we're somehow in the wrong here. And you might think, well, that would never happen in America. Yeah, the Romans thought that their empire wouldn't ever fall either. But we have built our country and lately our economy like a house of cards. I don't know if you've ever built a house of cards. They all fall down. So is your faith in the economy, is your faith in the stock market, is your faith in political leaders, is your faith in Jesus, even if it means life could be cut short because a stone might hit you instead of the boss? Do you love your family enough to lay down your life? Oh, yes, I love my spouse, I love my kids. I love. So you have the ability to lay your life down for people that you love. Do you love Jesus enough that you would be willing to lay your life down and that you, like the Apostle Paul, could say, I will preach the gospel by life or by death? Jesus and the disciples pack up and they head for Judea. When Jesus arrived in Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in the grave. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many people had come to console Mary and Martha on their loss. This was normal. Martha got word that Jesus was coming, so she went out to meet him. Mary stayed in the house. If you haven't read these stories before, I, that's your homework. I think it's a representative of two different kinds of humanity, people, personality profiles. Martha does the religious thing. She does the polite thing. She does the the big sister, mature thing. She wipes her tears for her brother. She goes out to meet the rabbi as he's coming to pay his condolences. Mary is led by her emotions and her feelings. And she's mourning so deeply for her brother. And she's so mad at Jesus for not coming and healing him that she stays hidden in her room mourning. I don't know which one's right and which one's wrong, but I I do see it in all of us. That sometimes we wipe our tears and we come to church because we feel like we have to. We have to come to church. We have to sing the song. We have to give in the offering. We have to do what we have to do. And we do it out of obligation to be a good Christian soldier for Jesus. And others of us are like, I don't feel like worshiping. I don't feel like getting out of bed today. I don't feel, so I'll just turn on the live stream at 11. By the way, the longer I pastor, the more I am convinced that anybody that gets up and goes to first service after daylight savings time in the spring gets extra credit in heaven. So all of you, all of you get extra credit in heaven. And you can just quietly judge the people at the 11 o'clock service. That's fine. Because 11 a.m. will be packed today to get that extra hour. So I give you all the credit. I have no idea why I said that because I went off the rails there a little bit. Oh, the differences between Mary and Martha. I don't know which one's right. Martha going out to do the right thing even though she didn't feel like it. Mary being led by her emotions and just staying there. Because it reveals, I think, all of us in some ways that we do things because we feel like we have to. Martha says to Mary, no, Martha says to Jesus, Lord, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know 
that God will give you whatever you ask. Martha's response to Jesus was faith. Jesus, I know that had you been here, he wouldn't have died. But since you weren't here, he's dead. And we're going to find out in a minute, it's been four days. It's not like he died an hour ago. He's been dead for four days. But if you'd have been here five days ago, he wouldn't be dead right now. She had faith that Jesus could heal. She did not have faith that Jesus had victory over death. So what we're going to see over the next few weeks of messages and what we're going to see in Easter in three weeks is that our God has victory over death. Jesus says, Martha, your brother's going to rise again. Martha says the religious answer, oh, he will rise when everyone rises at the last day. She's trying to be spiritual. She still doesn't have faith that Jesus can raise the dead. Jesus said, listen, lady, I am the resurrection and the life. This is one of seven times that Jesus uses the expression, I am. The name of God is I am. So Jesus looks her in the face and says, Martha, I am the resurrection. I am walking revival. I am life having victory over death. But listen to this. Anyone in 2021 in the mid-cities who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will actually never, ever die. Do you believe this, uncommon church? You will eventually stop breathing. You, eventually your heart will stop. You will never die. If you repent of your sin and you make Jesus the Lord of your life, if you live for Jesus, you will not experience death. You'll be 102 years old. You'll be surrounded by your friends and family. You will take your last breath, but you will go from life to eternal life. You will not experience death. We will miss you. We will mourn for you, but we will celebrate that you have not tasted death because there is no sting in death for the believers in Jesus. There is only life, which is why often a funeral for a believer is called a celebration of life. Martha, oh Lord, I've always believed that you are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. She sounds a lot like Peter. You are the one who has come into the world from God. And then Martha returned to Mary, and she said, baby sister, you better get your rear out here right now. Enough of this temper tantrum. Jesus is here, and he wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to see him. Jesus had stayed outside the village at a place where Martha had met him, and when the people who were at the house consoling Mary saw her leave hastily, they assumed she was going to Lazarus' grave to weep, so they followed her there part of normal Jewish mourning ritual. Mary arrived and saw Jesus, and she did something that all of us need to do from time to time. She fell at his feet. I don't like American culture. I lived in Israel for almost five years, and we've been traveling back and forth to Israel for, well, more than 25 years. I love Middle Eastern culture, and I love that when God looked at the earth, he picked Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 sons. He picked a Middle Eastern family to put the eventual plan of salvation. Jesus was not white. He was not an American. He was not a Republican. Jesus was Jewish from Israel in the Middle East 2,000 years ago. And I, I love that in Middle Eastern culture, we don't worship like we're at a tennis match or that we're at a PGA tournament and someone had a nice putt. But I love that sometimes... We fall down on our face and just worship. Sometimes I wrestle with people that are like Jeff or Anna, one of the worship leaders, be like, just lift your hands and worship. And American Christians are like, 
I had to pull my pants down. I had to be careful there. Hold on. I got my cool new Uncommon Youth sweatshirt that you can buy in the back. And we're like, I will never lift these hands because I am from Texas and I grew up Baptist. And although my old Baptist preacher has been in heaven for 30 years, he will know if I raise my hands in church. And when I get to heaven, he will come to me and say, you raised your hand at that Pentecostal church in Eulis. I saw it. <laughs> Meanwhile, you should know that your Baptist preacher is laying on his face in the throne room of God, just worshiping 24-7, crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lamb of God. I don't know why I got off on this tangent, but I do want to shake the American church a little bit. The commands that the Lord gave us in Scripture to dance and to shout and to lift up holy hands, that wasn't just meant for an ancient Middle Eastern people. It's meant for Texans in America in 2021. Can I get an amen? amen. Mary falls at Jesus' feet, and she repeats the same thing that Martha said. It's ironic that she said the same thing that her sister said. Mary said, Lord, if you had been here, Jesus wouldn't have died. Uh, Jesus wouldn't have died. Lazarus wouldn't have died. Jesus saw her weeping. She saw, Jesus saw the other people around wailing. And this is interesting. A deep anger welled up within Jesus. He was deeply troubled. Where did you put him? They said, come, Lord, and see. Then Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible. It's two words in Greek. Jesus wept. Why would Jesus weep if he knew he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead? He wasn't mourning for his friend. He was deeply moved with anger because of the grip that death has on all of us. So you have to understand, we were never created to experience death. We weren't created. Our, our bodies are remote. We were created in the image of God who is eternal life. We were not created to mourn. So when we mourn, it's it's contrary to what we were created to do. And when we mourn, when we, when we lose a loved one, we lose a parent, we lose a sibling, we lose a child, there's, there's an, an anguish and a pain, an emptiness that we feel that we were not created to feel. And it does two things. It moves God to anger and compassion. Which is why Jesus said in the Beatitudes that the Lord comforts those that mourn. So when you lose a loved one, do not mourn alone. Do not mourn in your own strength. Allow the Holy Spirit to comfort you. Jesus was moved with compassion because of the pain and the agony that Mary and Martha were feeling. He was moved with anger at the, the grip that death has on our culture. So he goes over to the tomb he says, roll the stone aside. Martha, being Martha, said, ah, uh, Lord, he's been dead four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? Uncommon church, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? See, sometimes we're like the servant and we're still asking God to do a man thing. But the Lord is saying, I can't be glorified in a man thing. I'm only glorified when God does a God thing. So stick with me. Put your faith in me. And don't expect me to do a man thing. Expect me to do a God thing. And then you'll see my glory revealed. And Jesus, you have to understand this, and I should have said it earlier. Ancient Jewish tradition. It's from one little obscure verse in the book of Job. The rabbis would say that someone's soul would stay present with the body for three days. So had Jesus raised his friend Lazarus from the dead in that first day or two, if Jesus would have come with the servant and gotten back there the day after Lazarus died and been raised on the second or third day, the Jews, due to an old wives' tale, would have said, oh, well, then Lazarus wasn't really dead. And Jesus just came and slapped him around a little and he was revived. Jesus waited till the fourth day. 
Jesus waited until the body had begun to decompose. Jesus waited until it was clearly going to be a God thing that he would receive the glory and not a man thing. So my question is, what thing in your life has died and is stinking? What financial thing, what hope, what dream, what marriage, what relationship with a family member has died that you are believing God to do a God thing? And that your faith can be in the Lord to do a God thing and not turn it into some sort of man-made creation. Because God only receives glory when he does a God thing, not when we do a man thing. They're playing me off. You're like, Pastor, you're reading the story too slow. They rolled the stone aside. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father... Thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I've said this out loud for the sake of all the people that are now standing around me so that they're going to believe that you sent me. Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. After four days of decomposing, the dead man came out, hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face still wrapped in a headcloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. This is not a parable. This is history. This happened. It was a precursor for what he was about to do a few weeks later in being raised from the dead on Easter. So you have to understand, the same spirit that raised Lazarus from the dead is the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that lives on the inside of you. And that when you lift your heart and you lift your hands in worship, the same spirit that cried out to Lazarus to come forth from the grave is the same spirit that lives and beats and breathes on the inside of you. I think it's interesting that, she, that Lazarus was still wrapped in the embalming clothes. See, they would soak cloths, strips of cloth in spices and oils and perfumes to try to cut down on the stench and he just came stumbling out like a zombie and Jesus said get the death clothes off of him up up on your feet because I think far too often we've got Christians in the church who never take off their grave clothes and they're still have these clothes that kind of smell like human religiosity but actually stink like death and Jesus is crying out to the church and saying I've raised you to new life take off the grave clothes and walk in new life too often we Christians stink talking to my kids recently I got an 18 year old 21 year old 24 year old almost a couple of birthdays coming up I said how many of your friends that you went to high school with and one of them still in high school drink and smoke weed and they laughed and they're like all of them you have to understand I sent my kids to a, a Christian high school means the Christians in the mid-cities are raising their children. They're being born in grave clothes. It hurt my heart. This is a long discussion we had. See, I just couldn't believe it. That people would willingly live a Christian life in grave clothes. To me, it mocks the holiness of God. To me, it nails Jesus to the cross all over again. Church, I can't speak for other Christians. I can't speak for other people in the mid-cities, but for me and for my house, We will serve the Lord. We will take off our grave clothes. We will live holy. We will pursue Jesus. We will be uncommon.
it's interesting that we are called as believers a peculiar people, a holy priesthood set apart in the world but not of the world. It's time to start acting like it. We talk different. We're entertained by different things. We don't stink like death and decay. Jesus, Mary and Martha responded to you even in their mourning with faith. They said that had you been there, Lazarus, they know your power that you would have healed him. They did not know that you had power over death. So Lord, I thank you that you receive all the honor and the glory for bringing dead things back to life. Lord, I ask that you would search our hearts. Holy Spirit, right now, if there's any dead thing in our lives, that you would search, shine a spotlight for each one. It could be a a relationship. It could be a sin that we've been hiding or struggling with. It, It could be a fear. It could be a pain from the past that somebody hurt us and abused us. It could be the loss of a a baby, a loss of a loved one, that we still carry this pain of death. And Lord, we we seek you in faith, but only in partial faith. We've, we've, We've limited what we think you can do. We think you can heal. We think you can comfort. We don't think you can completely bring life from death. So Lord, I pray that you would transform our hearts, our minds, our thinking to be that of faith. That you bring life where there's death. With every head bowed and every eye closed in prayer, I just want to talk to your hearts for a minute. Is there any area of your life that stinks like death? Is there any part of your life that you're still wrapped in grave clothes? Yeah, you're here. First service on a Sunday morning after daylight savings time. You're here. You're Martha. Second service is Mary, by the way. You're here. You you did the right thing. You came to church. You worship God. But do you really believe that Jesus can do the impossible and receive the glory? If you're here this morning and there's sin in your life, I want you to repent. Ask God to forgive you. And he will because he loves you. He's crazy about you. If you don't know the Lord, surrender your life to him today. If it's been a long time, you've walked away from God, you've allowed your heart to grow cold, you've allowed sin back into your life, today is your day to repent and to return to the Father's love, to take off the grave clothes you've been walking around in, that you can live holy like He is holy. I'd like to lead you in a prayer. So whether it's your first time or your first time in a long time, I'd like to know who I'm praying for. If you want to get right with God today, would you shoot your hand up real high? Just say, preacher, pray for me. I see your hand. I see your hands. Everybody else. I see your hands. Everybody else. Good. 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 I saw two or three hands shoot up. For the sake of these folk, why don't we all pray this together? If you believe it in your heart, pray it out loud. Say, dear Jesus, I repent. Please forgive me. Wash me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Strip the grave clothes off of me that I can walk in eternal life, that I can walk in holiness, that I can walk in faith, that you are the God who has victory over death. So in Jesus' name, help me to walk in life, eternal life, to speak life, to think faith, big faith. Nothing is impossible for you. In Jesus' name. Amen, church. What do you say for those that got right with God today?